before I mentioned how fired up I was for uh, today's event, because our topic today is leadership in a time of crisis, and our speaker uh, is Mark McCullum. We're so delighted that uh, Mark is here with us today. He could have done any number of things uh, today. Dave, uh, Mark is the president and CEO of Weatherford International. Uh, he's a former executive vice president and CFO of Halliburton. Uh, he, like David, is very involved in the community, serves on the board of regents for Baylor uh, University and the board of trustees for Baylor Medical Center. And he's on the advisory board uh, with every village and he has no shortage of things to do. So uh, thank you for being here with us. I was glad to be here. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and with that, Mark, I, I just want to invite you to uh, just, just share with us some of the lessons that you have learned and are learning about what it means to, to lead in the midst of difficulty and challenge. Sure, Tom. Yeah, no, this, I mean, what an amazing and frankly crazy time that we're living in right now. I mean, I, I don't think I could have ever if you had given me a, a pencil and tried to scratch out, you know, a scenario like this, I could have ever done this in my life. And I was thinking about it the other day, you know, over my 40 year career, you know, so obviously not my first crisis, as I said, not my first rodeo, but I, I think I've been through three hurricanes, two floods, um, three financial crises, several wars. We went through 9-11. Um, and I, I think that I've been through five significant oil and gas industry downturns. And these past couple of weeks have been unlike anything that I've ever been through. And, and I think part of this is because, you know, unlike many of these other things where there may be a small group of people affected and there may be winners or losers, you know, in, in some of those situations, it feels like every single person, every single leader in some form or fashion is facing a crisis right now. And, uh, but there are no, I mean, everybody's got to deal with something and it not, not even whether you're in the U.S. or anywhere around the world, you know, we're, we're facing that. And of course, you know, in our particular situation at Weatherford, um, you know, we were coming off of having to go through bankruptcy last year as a result of, uh, of uh, having, having too much debt, you know, emerged in the fourth quarter at the same time that uh, the oil and gas markets in the North American space were beginning to roll over. Uh, had had done course corrections in our business to try to adjust to that. And then immediately, you know, coming off of a, a pretty successful first quarter and feeling very good about that, you know, several weeks ago, then of course have, have faced an unprecedented uh, change in our marketplace. And the ener energy business, as those of you who are on who, who uh, are in the business with me, realize that we're basically have a double whammy. It's not just the impact of the pandemic and, and how it's affecting uh, work, work, not just in the US, but everywhere around the world, but also the fact that there's just too much oil and gas. There's too much gas being produced, oil and gas being produced relative to the demand. And of course the pandemic itself has shut down markets so that we're, we're significantly oversupplied and we're, we're having to now readjust our business to sort of what we're we're thinking may be a multi-year downturn in our industry, which would be as long as there really has ever been a downturn. And of course, even the actions of OPEC Plus, you know, the, 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 with the price war being resolved between Saudi Arabia and Russia a week ago, believe it or not, for us as a global energy business, energy services business, that actually was a negative because what's going to happen now is that while we had been relying on Russia and Saudi Arabia to help us, now they're beginning to turn down their, their budgets. And, and so now we're having to go back at it again and readjust our, our business to, uh, to, to address another leg down in this downturn. And we put out a press release this morning and over the last several weeks has been very difficult, but we've had to, you know, layoffs, uh, several thousand employees around the world. You know, we've had to to adjust uh, compensation programs and and uh, our capital budgets and spending plans. Uh, you know, uh, putting folks on shift work in areas and, and having to make some very hard decisions. And so it's a you know it, it is an incredibly challenging time. Like I said, everybody I think is 
having to face this in some way. You asked, you know, what I learned about leadership in general over these many years. And I think I'd like to start with that because I think that um, leading in a crisis definitely relates to, to what I think about, you know, what I've learned about leadership uh, more specifically. And so I thought, I thought I'd start there. And of course, you know, in the context of my comments today, I, I want everybody to understand, I'm also thinking about this in the, in the broader context of what does it mean to be a Christian leader during these times and, uh, and how does that interface? So let me start and just say, I, I think that, you know, the best leaders that, I've, that I have ever worked with, that I, that I see as I think about developing my people, uh, share seven different qualities, seven different characteristics um, that sort of walk through it. First is I think that good leaders are visionary. It means that they, un they understand the industry and that, you know, they're, they're very aware, even I would say intuitive about the market dynamics that are affecting their business. And they have the ability to look ahead and, and see and position their organization to address that, that view of the, of the forward marketplace. They're looking further ahead than the rest of the organization. And, and in particular for global businesses, that means not only being able to look ahead about the marketplace, but also to understand um, how to navigate different cultures, uh, the interplay between various regional uh, constituencies and you know, oftentimes they may be competitive dynamics that you've got to got to work through. But either way, you know, a visionary leader is the, has that ability to look out ahead of others in their organization. The second thing, beyond being just visionary, is they're also strategic, which means that they have the ability to not only look out ahead but also to to inspire and to empower their organization and their their people across their organizations. To work together to fulfill that vision, so it's a combination of long-term, you know, have a, have a long-term view, but good leaders also have the ability to break down a process to get toward that long-term view and, and to action their people toward achieving that goal. Mm -hmm. um, the third thing, and that's probably, you know, I don't know that these are any equal importance, but of course, good leaders are ethical; that they do the right thing, and and and, and you know, it's it's beyond. You know, in doing the right thing, obviously, good leaders um, uh, uh, are able to get you know the uh, moral authority to then lead their people because they, you know they people obviously have an intuitive sense of what's right and wrong, and they, they're looking for leaders to do that. But I think that also, uh, you know, for a leader in a broader perspective, being an ethical leader also um, instills confidence in their organizations that not only they're going to do the right thing, but that the place that they work is a safe place to work. It's a fair place to work. That there's there's a certain amount of justice and and uh, and that's going to be applied across the way. And that that if they're if they're looking toward advancing their career, that it's a it's a great place to work because they know they're going to get a fair shot. And and so in that safety, people find uh, you know it, it it improves the workplace environment just as a result of that leader being an ethical leader. The fourth thing that I think is really important is that leaders have to be courageous. That means that that in the context is not you know necessarily taking taking bad risk. You know, I mean, obviously, good leaders are prudent, but the, but they're but they're biased toward action, which means even when the decisions are hard, they're going to step up and they they're going to make a quick decision and 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 intuitively know what they need to do and lean in to make sure that the right things happen. The fifth thing is that good leaders are consistent. And what do I mean that mean? I mean, well, there's, there's a couple dimensions of being of consistency. First is that, you know, they, there's consistency in their decision-making, that they've got a decision-making framework uh, that, that they can apply, that, that their people know that when they make decisions day in and day out, that there's going, they can, they can draw a line through that and see that there's some consistency about how judgments are made how the decision will make, uh, uh, you know, how the leader will make certain decisions, how he will empower certain people, what decisions would he reserve for himself. But it gives his people confidence that whatever level of empowerment that he gives them, that they're willing to walk in that and be, be confident that they're not going to be reeled back and, and subject to uh, the whim of the leader who's going to be shifting all over the map. The second part of consistency is beyond just the decision making is also what I call emotional consistency. Um, you know, a good leader knows how to manage themselves 
just as they manage their people. And that means managing your temper, managing the way that you show up to work every day. Um, you know, we, we talk at Weatherford about a mood elevator and, and, and recognizing that, you know, how I show up every day, you know, whether I'm, you know, uh, down, tired, whatever can affect my decision making. And so I've got to be able to manage the way that I feel uh, and get myself up on the, uh, the mood elevator. We call it get to curious so that I'm at least willing to listen and ask questions and engage with my people. Um, uh, so that, that, that emotional consistency is really, really critical. The sixth thing in this list is that a good leader has to be selfless. That means that in being selfless, that they're focused on the success of not only the people that they work for, you know, whether it's the board of directors, their investors, or, or customers, but also that they're, they're invested in the success of the people that support them. And that, that, that effectively, you know, it's a, a, another term for this is being a servant leader. I think the best leaders are always servant leaders that are putting the, the needs of others ahead of themselves. And the final thing that I would say is really important for good leaders is that good leaders really inspire excellence in their people. And, and what I mean by that is that they can influence their people to give their best and they do it through both words, they do it through their actions, um, but, they, but they have the ability to create organizations of people that ultimately evolve toward what I call a culture of excellence. That the, the culture itself demands that everybody give their best at whatever they do and to, to, and, and to work as hard and, and as they can to, uh, to achieve the goals of the organization. So those seven characteristics, you know, now, now some of these characteristics are learned. I think that, that uh, you know, uh, uh, leaders that, that obviously have the ability to create vision and, and strategy, you know, the, they, can, they can learn some of those. Some of these uh, characteristics you can't learn. Uh, you know, they're, they're born with those. I mean, I think the last five, but the, but the reality is all of those things are very important. Now, as a Christian leader, of course, you know, you, when you look at that list, you say, well, all those are pretty good, you know, right? That, that's something that you would define as a Christian leader. But, but I think what's, what's critical for us as Christian leaders is that we got to understand that the overlay of our relationship with Jesus Christ adds critical and, and hopefully valuable dimension to that leadership style, right? If we're trying to embrace those leadership characteristics, then, then understanding what it is that Jesus does for us helps to um, not, not just make, you know, that, hey, we're going to try to achieve all these leadership characteristics on our own efforts, but we've got some significant help behind us that's going to help make that happen, right? So, for instance, you know, in Christ, you know, what we've got to understand is that, first of all, when we accept Christ, we have his presence, right? You know, he's not, you know, we've got Jesus living in us. And, uh, mm -hmm. and we also, and Jesus promised this um, in scripture that, you know, we have the spirit of truth or what he called the helper. That's, you know, the Holy Spirit that's there to also, you know, work with us to help. To, and the Bible tells us that the helper is there to teach us, to guide us into all truth, to attract, to allow us to bear spiritual fruit, that can make us relationally attractive to others, but also more useful to God. Um, you know, John 14, uh, 19 through 20, it says, you know, because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I'm in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. And so he promised, he told us, you know, I'm going to be there with you. And uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 30 says, and because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So that presence that we've got, you know, for him working with us is critical because we know that we can lean on him. We can, we've got the Holy Spirit that we can lean on to, to help us to, to guide us in making proper decisions. The second thing, and, and probably as important as anything, you know, as we think about leading in crisis is that we've got his peace. John 14, 27 says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So he, he told us, you know, if, you, if you're, you know, allowing me to live through you and abiding, have an abiding relationship, we're going to have his peace. 
And so, and you say, okay, well, how in the world can I have peace in this kind of situation? Well, I mean, part of this is kind of understanding what it is that Jesus did for us. I mean, you know, you think about it, because by faith, we know that God loves us and he's called us. He has a plan for our lives, that he's working everything around us for our good and his glory. And that absolutely, there's absolutely nothing that can separate us from either his love or nullify his grace that he's extended us, including death and nothing in between. You know, that goes a long way to helping me know, you know, God's got this. Whatever the situation, God's got it. And so I can approach this with a level of confidence and courage that I, I might not otherwise have. The third thing is obviously Jesus said that we'd have his power. Ephesians 1.19 says, you know, that, that Paul is admonishing us or, or hopefully encouraging us to say that we might know the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. That's power that, that Christ in, promised us is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. And he said that's available to us to be able to draw from and use and that we've been empowered to do good works. And we have everything for life and godliness as part of the promises that we've given. So those three assets, right, his presence, his peace, his power, give a Christian leader tremendous help in successfully um, demonstrating the inherent critical leadership qualities that I've talked about earlier. I mean, you, you can say, well, I wasn't born with some of these talents, right? I've got a, I've got a temper and I, I just don't know if I could do this, right? You know, I don't. I don't necessarily, I'm not a good speaker, you know, oftentimes, and I don't know how I can best encourage my people. Well, the, the good news as a Christian is that we've all been born again. And, and this time, though, we've been born with the greatest leader in the universe, who's now indwelling us, but also standing ready to lead, through, lead us through whatever it is that we might face, if we'll just let him. And so that's, a, that's, that's tremendous. There's one final thing, though, that, that I think is really important for us as leaders, which, which, again, I think is critical to understand not only embracing these leadership qualities, but thinking about crisis is that in, in accepting Jesus as our, our personal Savior, um, God has given us purpose. We have purpose in his eternal plan. Um, God's plan, of course, the Bible tells us, was to reconcile all things to himself. And so for us as Christians, what he's also said is, you know, I've made you my ambassador. Effectively, you have a ministry of reconciliation too. And what and it's simply put, very simple, our ministry of reconciliation is to love God and to help others love him too. It's as simple as that. And so if we think about that and we say, look, if, we're, if we can mature in our relationship with Jesus and get to that point and understanding not, not only what he's doing for us, but our purpose that we can get ourselves to the place in our lives as Christian leaders where God's glory and the needs of others eclipse our own desires. And sort of get to that point and say, you know what, it's not about us. And, and, and in doing so, what we can do is bring a kingdom mindset, it's what I call it, a kingdom mindset to our leadership style and, and, how we, and, and how we execute the work that we do every single day. And what do I mean by that kingdom mindset? Well, it's, it's essentially saying, God's plan for my life is bigger than you or me or anyone else that we can see. And that success in God's economy is, is more a product of being, okay, who God wants me to be than doing what God wants me to do. Now, certainly God wants me to do things, but he's more important. He's more interested in my character and how I execute my work than it is what I get done. And ultimately, because of those things, my job is what I do but it's not who I am. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a sinner saved by grace. And, and my role, whatever he's given me, is just a title. And if anything, that title really indicates responsibility. It, 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 it uh, represents accountability and a stewardship, not a prerogative or an entitlement. And so therefore, in the end, what, what I'm all about is trying to make sure that I'm investing in my people, in the world, and ultimately, whatever I'm leading through is trying to make sure that I'm pointing toward the one who saved me. Now, there's one final leadership secret that I want to, to talk about, and just sort of, this is something that I was taught many years ago um, uh, by, by one of my, my, my coaches, and I've, I have 
tried to embrace this always. And I think it's important for every single person. And I don't care whether your leadership is in the home or whether it's in business or whether it's at church or whatever, but it's what's called the shadow of the leader effect. Every single one of us cast a shadow. You're influencing your actions, influence the actions of others. There are people that are watching you and what you do and how you do what you do every day, whether you know that or not. And the larger the organization that you lead or whatever, the, the larger, the, the, the broader the shadow that you cast. I mean, it's kind of like a vapor trail that, a, that an airplane leaves, you know, as it's flying through, you know, the upper atmosphere, you know, it looks thin, but it starts spreading and it goes a long way well behind the airplane. In the same way, each of us is leaving somewhat of a vapor trail behind us in all the things that we do. So when I say that, I want you to understand that when you lead, not only, are people, uh, not only will people watch you, but if you lead well and embracing these characteristics, they're gonna follow you. That's what causes folks to follow, is if you're leading well. But if you spiritually lead well, they're not only gonna follow, but they're gonna also ask why. They're gonna ask why you lead the way you do. People, and it's the interesting thing, the dynamic, and I've seen this over my career, right? People aren't attracted to you, it's not you. What they're being attracted to is the reflected, of the reflected glory of Jesus that's coming through you because you're leaning in now. And so, um, so, so that's how I think about leadership in, a, in the broadest sense. And so let's talk about for a second leading in crisis. And so, you know, so what's particularly different about leading during times of crisis? Well, really nothing about any of those principles. Thank you very much. I'm done. <laughs> so, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> obviously, you know, what I'm really saying is that these leadership principles, in my view, are constants no matter what the situation. I think, Tom, you said this right, right? You know, we're all good leaders are always going to employ those same principles, but their importance and their urgency are magnified in a crisis. And therefore, a leader's style and their approach has to flex given the situation that they're faced but still thinking about all those things as being characteristics that are really important. So, you know, well, why do they have to flex in a crisis? Well, you know, in a crisis, people are afraid. This is the bottom line, people are afraid. They're afraid of losing their job. They're afraid of getting sick in this current situation. At 9-11, it was the fear of terrorist attacks. For, you know, for some, it's as basic as the fear of running out of toilet paper right now. I mean, but, but you know, people are basically afraid of the unknowns. There are, you know, there are, the majority of folks that are out there have difficulty dealing with ambiguity and uncertainty. And so, and so as they treat within that fear of the unknown, it causes individuals to employ what I call stress behaviors that are unhealthy, they're inherently selfish, I mean, you could talk about the hierarchy of needs or whatever else, but when people start backing down the hierarchy of needs, they, they get in, in, you know, they start having different behaviors, either under stress or, or, or being more selfish that, that are not good. And when you multiply that across an entire organization, and then you start magnifying that around the globe, as we're currently saying, the result can be a lack of productivity at best, as we're seeing in, the, in what's happening in the current economy, but but at worst, you know, in, particularly in my business, it can result in poor safety. We can have accidents. People could get hurt. We have poor uh, service quality in serving our customers, and 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 can lose millions of dollars because people are not focused on what they're supposed to do. And and broadly speaking, you know, left unchecked by a leader, you can lose organizational control really fast if you don't step in and do something about that fear. And furthermore, I just would sort of say, you know, when this fear builds, there's no help as a, as a leader, there's no help coming from the outside. You know, our investors are mad, our customers are mad, they want price cuts, they want to cancel work, our, our suppliers are mad, they want, to, they want to keep sending you stuff even though you can't necessarily take it. Debts and taxes and bills are still due. Um, and the noise from outside of our organization is deafening. I mean, it's easy, particularly that as, as we're sheltering at home right now that, you know, with the 24-hour, with the you know, news cycle, 
the media machine is is just you know basically set to run on fear if you think about it for a second the more shocking the headlines the more readers and viewers they get and the more people that they get kind of sucked into that news cycle the more the mob rules mm -hmm. so you know i guess you know the first thing i would just say is as we consume the news and and the information from any any you know media source that we uh, decide to employ, we as leaders have to first remember that we can't get sucked into that fear. In fact, our job as leaders, if you want to kind of have an overarching and leadership in crisis, is that our our job in this er, uh, area, in a nutshell, is overcoming the fear. I just highlight that we our job is to overcome the fear. So how do we do that? Well, I'm going to go back to those seven leadership uh, ideas and think about, you know, okay, what are some specific things that you can do and that I've tried to employ um, to, to help in the crisis? So vision. Well, you know, during a crisis, it's very difficult people for people to see past the current crisis, right? From experience, now as a leader, I told you I've been through this before, you know, you know that at some point this is going to pass, whether it's three months, six months, nine months, at some point, we're going to get back to the norm, to normal. The question for a leader is to help define what's on the other side. Once we get to, is there a new normal or is it going to be back to things as usual? And what we've got to do as leaders is to, to be able to paint that picture of what's the other side look like and get our people focused on the long term. Thinking about, th thinking through that. So part, part of my communication has been to say our strategy has not changed. You know what we're trying to do as an organization and trying to, to build our culture and our and and how our organization will look and interface with customers isn't you know isn't being knocked off center by this current you know yeah we're taking a pause to address the crisis but on the backside of this what we want to do as we go through the crisis is continue to execute the things that are going to be you know get us toward our long term goal. Um, I, I use this example sometimes. I mean, I, I'm not, a, I'm a, well, I'm a terrible skier. I learned to ski when I was 40, and I think I've done it about 10 times. And quite frankly, I, you know, at 61 now, I, I, I think I've decided to give up. But, you know, it's what, I, what I always remember is I was learning to ski, and I was, you know, going from the pizza, french fry, pizza, french fry, you know, kind of, you know, trying to, to go down the hill, and I was busy, you know, trying to focus on my feet and my skis and all this kind of stuff and, and invariably landing on my backside. I always remember my instructor, you know, telling, looking at me and saying, look, if you're ever going to figure this out, what you've got to do is you got, you cannot look at your ski tips. You've got to look at the mountain. You have to look at the mountain if you're going to be able to ski and work through the bumps and the curves and the ice and all that kind of stuff. And so, that's in my view as a leader, we've got to be focused on the mountain, not our ski tips in a crisis situation. The second thing, so we talk about strategy, right? So the vision is the long term. Strategy, you know, as we think about, I think it's really important in a crisis that the leaders got to acknowledge reality and get moving on responding to the implications of the crisis as fast as possible. It's, you, you know, if you're in denial about, you know, what's happening or whatever, you're going to be in trouble. And, and part of the problem with, you know, with the, 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 the leadership mandate is that you've got to engage and lay out the plan. People, your people are going to hesitate when it comes to cutting costs or personnel or veering off of formally agreed plans. Even, even when they know it's the right thing to do, they're going to hesitate because in a crisis they're gonna have this renewed question, okay, well, who's empowered to make those choices? And it may not necessarily be, be my choice to, to let somebody go or to cut that cost or whatever. And so you as a leader have got to understand, you've got the responsibility to kick things off, to engage and lay out a plan. And so, you know, part of what I try to do in my organization and what I'd recommend to others is, you know, um, divide the work. You know, part of keep, keeping people engaged and working is, Think about how you can purposely divide the work and execute through teams, set teams of people um, so that you're keeping them busy, you're keeping them engaged, and you're keeping them committed to the outcome so that they feel like they're a part of the solution and doing something rather than being just on the receiving end of whatever's happening. And so the more you can divide, 
um, and, and keep people kind of pressing forward, um, the more of that will help. Ethics. Of course, you know, we always want to do the right thing, but I'll tell you, you know, in a, in a crisis situation, it's very easy for a leader to, to justify cutting corners or squeezing others, you know, when you're feeling, if you're in a financial pinch or others, and, and, I, and I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one, but you know, as people are trying to figure out, okay, what are the things that we can do to be responsive to the crisis in order to save our business and to, to save others? You know, there's always a list of things that come in that I think require some ethical decision making around, is this the right thing to do? And do we do that? You know, and so, um, you know, if you, you know, if you kind of, you know, grab tight on your moral compass, you know, and continue to do things, you know, to just say, look, you've got to be ethical through this and do the right thing to protect your people, to protect the long-term reputation of your, of your company, your organization that you're working with, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the consequences, even if it may cost you a little bit at the margins, you know, or you, uh, I think you've got to continue to, to create that ethical framework because if you don't do it during crisis, you won't have the moral authority you know, uh, once you emerge from crisis, because people will remember what you what you decided, how you decided it, and it will it will impact how they feel about you and their own safety in in the, in the normal course. And of course, tied with that is courage, right? You've got to make the difficult decision. The the, the organization in a crisis is going to look to the leader to be the anchor, and um, and so they they're. And it's not just about making the right decisions, but it's also being calm in the midst of the crisis, right? To, to continue to say, I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to approach this thing and, you know, look, it's, we're all a little afraid, you know, we're all worried about our health or whatever else. But in the end, you know, I'm, I'm going to rest in Jesus and know he's got me taken care of. And I'm going to, to, to approach this thing with a calmness that um, is, not only apparent, but is remarkable to the people that work for me. I will tell you during my previous crisis I've been through along the way, the single biggest factor that folks have come back and asked me about has been my ability to remain calm in the storm. Mm -hmm. And so I just encourage you there to say, you know what, that's, that's, that, that's when your light shines brightest. Consistency. You know, for us, you know, uh, part, part of thinking about being consistent, you know, when I can't be there every day in this situation to walk the halls, to, uh, to, to go through and, and uh, visit with folks and have uh, um, show up in the cafeteria or whatever and be a presence, right? What we've tried to do is establish a regular cadence of work activities, high touch meetings or communications that keep the organization at every level linked together. So as, a, as an example, you know, um, every day starts with a daily crisis management uh, meeting in the morning that, that we've got uh, professionals around the world that meet together to talk about not only the COVID-19 uh, response that we have about what's happening with our people, but also um, uh, uh, how we are responding to, to the downturn itself. I have actually daily staff meetings. In a normal situation, I probably have a staff meeting once a month you know, and, or, 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 or even bi-weekly if, if it was a little bit busier, but we're doing staff meetings every single day um, right after that morning crisis management meeting to be, be sure that we know exactly not only what we've got to execute during the day, but it gives my team an opportunity to interface with each other and make sure that the conversation is, st is steady and, uh, and smooth. Um, to the larger organization, I'm doing bi-weekly crisis uh, communications. We're sending out a note, even if it's, you know, hey, let me remind you to wash your hands and to, to protect your family and to be safe. But something that's going out that, that's a constant reminder to the organization as we're dispersed, that we're still here, we're still operating, we're still serving our customers. In those communications, we're celebrating customer successes and milestones with new technology. But, but it's, it's key to stay in front of your people and make sure that, that they they're linked in and they're always at the bottom of those, those communications. We've got a phone number that says, if you need help, your fa you know, such situation, if you got some kind of sickness, here's the employee hotline, call that number and your, your Weatherford family is here for you. We're going to be there 
in case you need you need us. And then um, I started doing, uh, you know, this was something I saw some others, but doing biweekly videos, uh, just even using this this technology of shooting a video um, to remind folks that I'm still here gives me an opportunity to kind of empathize with um, with uh, with my folks, but uh, but also to to uh, to talk through some of the decisions that we're having to make. So you know, in, in these all communications, right? You're just thinking about you know what are we communicating? Where we're we're acknowledging the situation. We're being honest about the necessary actions that we need to take. We're celebrating what's working. We're reiterating the vision, the long-term vision of the company, and that we're working toward it. But most importantly, it's not just what we're communicating, but how we're communicating. And to try to establish this consistency, we're showing empathy toward those that are affected. Um, you know, we've got seven across the 23,000 people in Weatherford, we've got seven cases of COVID-19. I know because I know those seven cases, you know, that we've got, you know, we've got three in the U.S. There's one in Colorado Springs and one in Broussard and there's one in Houston that we're monitoring. I've got one in Mozambique and one in Brunei. And one in the in the UAE, and so, but I'm, but I'm, I'm, I pay attention, and they know through these communications that I know who's who's being affected, and that we're we've got our finger on it, and we're trying to, we're empathizing with this. So, so we're doing that. We we use these communications to encourage and support our values and our culture, and using the the, the common language that we employ to, as we've we've tried to create a what we call a one weather for culture. And of course, for me, most particularly, is that in these communications, exuding courage and determination that we're going to get through it, going to be fine. You know, we're 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 going to make it, and with everybody pitching in, you know, we're going to get to the other side, and we're going to be a stronger company on the backside as a result of all their hard work and focus and uh, and sacrifice. And speaking of sacrifice, obviously, you get to servant leadership, right? This is kind of where the rubber meets the road. And I would just tell you as a leader, as a Christian leader particularly, you don't ask anything from others that you're not willing to do yourself. Hmm. And, uh, and, and I, think, you know, I think we all know this, right? The best leaders show sacrifice in times of crisis, not selfishness. And because the sacrifice that we show as leaders is gonna bring out the sacrifice in others. So when I had to step forward and I had to ask my organization to, uh, the, you know, you're not going to get a raise this year, sorry. And, and by the way, we're going to have to cut heads. The very first thing that the decision that I had to make is that I'm cutting my, my compensation by 20%. And the rest of the leadership team are cutting our compensation by 20%. And I'm not going to ask you to take a bigger cut than I'm taking. And so, you know, by trying to reach out and to make sure that they understand that, that, I'm willing to, to, to step in and, and be a part of the solution, not just ask it from others. So that sacrifice obviously brings out the sacrifice in others, but, the, but unfortunately, so does the selfishness. So we've got to be careful and make sure that as we make decisions that in some ways that we're not excluding ourselves from the pain that's got to, to follow. And lastly, I would say, you know, just inspiring excellence. This is where the real, the shadow of the leader um, effect is most important. You know, I can do these videos, I can give the most inspiring speech to my people during the middle of a crisis, but the reality is that my actions during this thing, during this time frame, speak five times louder than anything I can say. Um, they're watching me. And so I've got to be very careful about what I do, how I do it, you know, and, 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 uh, in, in terms of making sure that I continue to ins in inspire my people to, to give their best during this period of time. Uh, you know, a good leader is not the guy who's gonna be out there bragging about filling his garage with toilet paper or clearing the shelves at the grocery store. And, uh, and I'll just say this, a good leader is not the guy who's gonna be at home, you know, take, using his shelter at home time, binging on Netflix, right? You know, what my team needs to understand is that you know I'm getting up at the first crack of dawn and my computer's on and I'm working hard, and that you know so when I'm when I'm working through and I'm pushing my team toward what I'm going to call business as usual that they understand that I'm willing to, to you know put my my shoulder to the plow just as much as anything and that um, and that that 
I continue to, to exude executive presence and, and confidence in everything I do. I, I, I tell this story, you know, uh, before I shot my first video, you know, we've been here for a few weeks and, and uh, I just had gotten so busy. I'm doing things. I hadn't shaved. I mean, it was kind of an easy thing. You know, I don't have to get over to the office. And so I started growing a beard. Last time I grew a beard was when I was in my twenties when I used to go backpacking. And, and so I, the day came, you know, I was going to shoot my first video and, and I, I walked out and my wife looked at me and she goes, are you sure you want your organization to see you looking like that? She goes, I don't think they're gaining a lot of confidence when you look like, you know, Jeremiah Johnson and you're living off the grid. <laughs> and I said, you know, you're absolutely right. You know, so I shaved and that, this is how it's been since then. Right. You know, but that, but it was a, it was a great admonition to say, okay, you know, they take their clues in that shadow of the leader. They're taking their clues from the leader. If I've looked like I've got it together and I'm, you know, I'm embracing this new normal that we're having to deal with, but, you know, um, we're working hard to continue to keep this thing moving forward, then they're going to do that. And I close it just saying, you know, look, as Christians, you know, we, we trust in a God who's sovereign, who's in control. And we're not trusting in earthly circumstances or political leaders or, or even ourselves, right? You know, 2 Timothy 1.17 uh, says, For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And fear should not dictate our actions to what's happening in the world. And that's particularly true as leaders. And so I would just say to, to tell you as, you, as you think about leading in crisis, to just ask the question that I'm constantly asking myself is that I, am I getting up every day and am I acting and leading like God's in control or am I trying to control the situation myself? Because if I'm doing, trying to do it myself, I don't think I'm going to be very successful. You know, I, you know, if I had lots of time, Tom, you know, I, I would love to, you know, to take, take you through a book study. You know, I, I, the book of Nehemiah in the Bible is probably one of my favorite books. It, in, in part, well, for, well, first of all, I would, I would just I would I would tell the, the group, you know, I've never actually finished an entire leadership book except for the Bible, because I think it's the best leadership book out there. You know, I read bits and pieces of other things, but the reality is I can't kind of keep going back to the real source. And Nehemiah, in my view, is the best leadership book in the Bible. And, uh, and particularly if you've got time as you're, as you're studying, I would encourage everybody to go back and read the first five chapters of Nehemiah, because it is a, it is a perfect picture of everything that I'm trying to sort of convey to you. You know, Nehemiah, you know, found himself as a, the, the cup bearer to the, to um, the Persian King Artaxerxes in a position, but yet heavy on his heart that God placed it, that he had a purpose which is to go back to Jerusalem and build the wall. And then you read in, John, in, the, in Nehemiah 1 and 2, where he went through the process of asking permission. And it says very clearly, he said, you know, the, that the king granted him everything he needed, but, but more importantly, that the good hand of God was upon me, that he felt God's presence prayerfully, had, had engaged God in that process. And he had a peace about going before the king, even though it could have, could have been his life. And the king, through God's providence, gave him the power, both through a title, governorship, but also through letters that allowed him to get all the materials he needed and to pass all the borders and, and to get the resources that he needed to build the wall around Jerusalem as, uh, uh, during this period of time. And, uh, and, and he, he went through uh, a process, you know, of, uh, of organizing the people to, to, to build but of course, as soon as he started the process of building the wall in Nehemiah 4 and 5, it talks about that all of a sudden he ran into a crisis. And it said, you know, the people, there was too much rubble for the people to maneuver and build. There was, they were tired because of the significant amount of work. They were exhausted. They were afraid because of the threats of attack from, uh, from their enemies that surrounded the nation, you know, the nation. And to top it all off, they were hungry because they didn't have enough food in the city. And so Nehemiah 4 and, and Nehemiah 5 goes through a process where Nehemiah responds to that crisis of dividing the team into people, of casting the long-term vision that we got to get this wall built, which was symbolic not of just of the protection of the city, but also the, the you know, setting apart the nation of Israel for, for God and, and glory in, in, in protecting his temple. And so, you know, establishing that vision for the people, but dividing the team, the, the 
the, the group, the, the, uh, the workers into families on various parts of the wall and, you know, having swords and trials and all the things that he did to action, you know, uh, uh, the, the organization during that time of crisis and including not even taking his own rations and being a selfless, a servant leader during that process to make sure that the people had the food that they needed to, uh, to be able to accomplish the work. And in the end, they got it done in record time. And it, it was a miracle, but a remarkable leadership lesson in a time of crisis. And I would just encourage folks to, to, to go and read that and, and to be encouraged by God's word, you know, and, and what, it, what it means to lead in crisis. I guess I would close by saying, you know, sort of remembering that um, it's when things are darkest that light shines the brightest. And for us as Christian, you know, when we think about ourselves being light, you know, the light of Christ, you know, that, that um, the reflected glory of, of, of Jesus, you know, in our lives, it's times like this, in times of crisis, that people are going to see our light shine the brightest. And we just let Jesus work through us. And so my encouragement is just lean in, you know, let him, you know, guide you and, and direct you and empower, empower you to lead. You know, he'll give you the words, he'll give you the, 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 the thoughts, the actions, and the strategies. And, uh, and in the end, you know, what, what I said, people are going to see Jesus. They're not going to see you, but they're gonna, you're going to start, you know, in the Bibles, this is another promise. They're going to start asking questions. So just be prepared to, to not just to walk the walk, but talk the walk on the backside of this, <laughs> because you're going to have a lot of explaining to do and a lot of opportunity to, uh, to share your faith with those around you. Oh, that's beautiful. That reminds me of Peter saying, being ready to give an answer to those who ask about the hope within us. And it sounds like a leadership role is just a prime spot for, uh, to put hope on display in the midst of, of challenge. So yeah, that's right. That's that's exactly right. Well, let, let me just review these real quick, Mark. The leaders are visionary. The second is have a strategy. Is that what it was? Yes, or, or, or strategic, strategic, strategic. Right? They're thinking, of, thinking about things to do to execute toward the vision, right? Near term. Right. And they're ethical, they're courageous, they're consistent, both in decision-making, they have a framework for decision-making, and they also have an emotional consistency where they manage themselves and, and how That's they right. show up every day. Uh, they, are, they are selfless. Yes. Uh, servant leadership is what we're talking about here. They inspire excellence in others. Those yeah. are the seven. And then for the, for the Christian leader in particular, we're invested with, uh, Christ's presence, we have his peace, we have his power, and uh, we his have purpose. his purpose. Mark, you've been super generous with your time. I, I know you from the things you've said, you are not sit around, sitting around wondering what you're going to do all day, any day. So uh, to carve out a chunk of time like this for us in the middle of the day is, is very kind of you. We really appreciate that. Well, well thank you, Tom, for the opportunity. That, I really appreciate it.